There is a picture from the period just before the outbreak of the Great War. It shows two women of roughly the same age in their middle 50s, dressed as was the custom in their Sunday finest. They are standing in front of a dark wooden door surrounded by panes of glass, the front door of the main building of the Harvard College Observatory. While they are stiffly posed, as was common given the slowness of photographic exposure at the time, it is clear that they are comfortable with each other and familiar with their surroundings. On the left, dressed in white and looking like one's grandmother, is Annie Jump Cannon, the classifier of stars according to their spectra. On the right, dressed in a darker gray suit that buttoned down the front, is the more slender Henrietta Swan Levitt, minister's daughter and hunter of variable stars. Both women would come to the observatory from reasonably well-to-do families that provided them with college educations and good connections. While they were not among the first hired there, they would become the nucleus of some 40 or so workers that would make many of the observatory's discoveries possible. They would oversee a change in directorship from Edward Pickering to Harlow Shapley and preserve the ethic and working spirit of an institution doing much to shape our knowledge of the wide universe, something that would come to be understood to be much bigger than anyone thought. This week on the Scientific Odyssey, we tell their stories. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 37.2, Supplemental. The Harvard Calculators, Part 2. If William Ena Fleming's and Antonia Murray's lives and personalities can be thought of as having been in stark contrast to each other, those of two of the other Harvard calculators, Henrietta Swan Levitt and Annie Jump Cannon, were much more similar in many, many ways. Both would study astronomy and earn college degrees in the discipline. Both would suffer from hearing loss that would affect their social interactions while also focusing their work and both would make fundamental contributions to our understanding of the universe, though, as much as anything, this would be accomplished through an enormous amount of hard work and dedication to data collection. It's hard to know where to start with these two gifted astronomers, as their lives are parallel in so many different ways, but we're going to go ahead and try to begin by looking at Miss Cannon's life, as she was born five years earlier and would outlive her colleague and friend by some two decades. Annie Jump Cannon was born on December 11, 1863 in Dover, Delaware. Her father, Wilson, was a shipbuilder, a banker, and a state senator, and her mother, Wilson's second wife, was named Mary Jump, and she possessed an enduring love of the stars, one she would often share with her oldest daughter, using an old astronomy textbook to point out the constellations that could be seen at night through the attic windows of the family's home. It's a lovely picture to think of the two, searching out the stars by name and learning the stories of the pictures human beings have long placed in the heavens. As a brief aside, for those of you who might be interested in doing something similar with your children and younger relations, I can think of no better book than H.A. Ray's wonderful 1952 text, The Stars, A New Way to See Them. Better known for his curious George books, Ray was an astronomy enthusiast, and his book of the constellations was among the first to connect the stars with lines that looked a great deal more like what the constellations were supposed to be. 
This is now a fairly common practice, but it more or less originates with his work. The book is still in print, as is his publication designed for younger readers, Bind the Constellations, and I hearty, heartily recommend them, even if you're just going out to learn on your own. Annie's mother encouraged her daughter to follow her interests and suggested she study mathematics and the sciences. She began her work and studies at the Wilmington Conference Academy, now known as Wesley College. And based on her aptitude in these areas, it was recommended she continue her education at a college where she would have the opportunity to pursue those kinds of disciplines and studies. In 1880, she traveled to Massachusetts to attend Wellesley College under the tutelage of Edward Pickering's one-time student, the physicist Sarah Frances Whiting. Excelling in both physics and astronomy, she learned spectroscopy from Whiting and graduated as the 1884 valedictorian and then returned home to help run the family household. It is a strange thing for a woman as talented and well-regarded as Cannon to not have found a path into additional opportunities in the sciences, even given the times, but her decision may have been influenced by the loss of her hearing during her last couple of years at Wellesley. While the sources are a bit hazy on this, the broad consensus seems to be that Cannon came down with scarlet fever during this time and this disease rendered her mostly deaf. Though, there is another train of thought that her hearing loss didn't happen until later in 1893. If the earlier date is true, her return to Dover may well have been to help her adjust and also kind of reflect on the idea that would have been somewhat prevalent at the time that she was no longer quote-unquote marriageable material and thus would spend her life as something of a dowager. What is pretty clear, though, is that Cannon wasn't really satisfied with just being a household manager. While her mother did teach her the subject of household economics, something that would become vitally important in her scientific work down the road, which is kind of that idea of how to run an organized and efficient household, Cannon found a good deal of time to teach herself photography, a craft that was becoming inexpensive enough during this time that hobbyists could begin to really participate. Still interested in, t in astronomy, Cannon traveled to Europe in 1892 with a Blair box camera in hand to view the solar eclipse that would be visible in Spain and to take pictures of the surrounding countryside. Upon returning home, she sent copies of her photographic work and associated prose written during her trip to the camera company. So impressed were they that the material was turned into a promotional pamphlet that was handed out at the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. Additionally, she tutored math and American history to local students and played organ at her local church. It is interesting to wonder what her life would have held in store had not tragedy struck her household just a year later when her mother died. The blow was a severe one for her, and three months after her mother had passed, she wrote in her journal, quote, Why am I still here in my little room, surrounded by my memories? My mother is ever before me. I can see how people lose their minds, for I believe I shall if I am not aroused by something. She was mine, and always will be, my most precious mother. Twelve weeks ago tonight, she was downstairs, in the spare room, and was more worried about my taking a nap on my couch, without covering, than about herself. She said that she knew I was going to be sick, for I looked so. And here I am, after twelve weeks of agony, such as I shall never have to pass through again. Here I am well, my constitution will carry me through many weary years. Yet, may I be led into a useful, busy life. I am not afraid of work. I long for it. What can it be? End quote. Struggling now to make ends meet, and without an anchor to Dover, Cannon reached out to her former mentor, Sarah Frances Whiting, and asked if there might be some sort of part-time work for her teaching at Wellesley. Whiting, remembering her student's exceptional talent, hired her as a junior physics instructor. This opened up the opportunity for Canada to take graduate classes and to continue to learn more about spectroscopy. This soon led Annie to look at what opportunities might be available at nearby Radcliffe College. 
Radcliffe had a better telescope than Wellesley did, and Cannon hoped to be able to use it to do some work in astrophotography and stellar spectra. Using the observatory there required that she be a student, and so in 1895 she enrolled as what could be called a special student, or what we might now call a post-baccalaureate student, taking classes and learning how to coax images from Radcliffe's telescope. Now, as we've discussed in the past, Radcliffe had something of a special relationship with Harvard, in that while it was an all-women's institution, many of the faculty from Harvard would travel to the school to deliver lectures identical to those being given at their home school. In this way, it canon came to the attention of Arthur Seale, Pickering's right-hand man at the Harvard College Observatory. In the practical research course that he taught, he saw that Cannon was significantly more talented and knowledgeable than the typical student and also a good bit more mature. Thus, in 1896, a year after Henrietta Swan Leavitt had followed a similar path to employment, Pickering hired Cannon on Seale's recommendation to work on observing variable stars. She would never leave the observatory. As 1896 came to a close, after her first year of employment under Williamina Fleming's supervision, Cannon wrote in her journal, quote, Soon it will be 97, and three years have passed. Two busy years at Wellesley, and this one at the Harvard Observatory. The busy life I so longed for has been opened up to me. Friends have come to me from the great world, and my heart, my life, are now the study of astronomy. They little know what it means to me how it was only the thread holding my reason, almost my life. I no longer look forward with dread. The days have no terror. I long for my mother just the same, but I feel that I have the patience to run my race, to do the work set before me, and am able to find contentment in my surroundings. I could not help it, thrown in as I am with such kind people." End quote. And before we leave Wellesley and Radcliffe behind, at least in terms of the story of Cannon's life, she would remain in touch with Whiting and participate in the appropriate coursework and research work so that in 1907 she would be awarded a master's degree in astronomy. Pickering hired Cannon to do more than just computational work at the observatory. Her ability to actually operate a telescope meant that she could be trusted to make measurements with one of the observatory's instruments, especially given all the experience that she had. While she had been a student at Wellesley the first time, she had observed the passage of the 1892's comet whose brightness had varied substantially over the course of its appearance in the sky. Professor Whiting had assigned the task of observing this comet to her students during Cannon's junior year, and so the young woman would have seen the comet's nucleus fragment into many pieces. At Harvard, she was given a set of variable stars to observe with the 6-inch telescope in the observatory's west wing, in the hope that she would be able to establish light curves for her targets. During the day, she was given a project similar to what Antonia Murray had been doing. Just as Pickering had figured out how to coax larger and more detailed spectra from the Draper telescope in Cambridge, Solon Bailey had applied a similar process to some images being taken by the 13-inch Boyden telescope in Peru. Again, with her experience from working with Whiting before and after her hiatus, Cannon was able to quickly pick up what the work entailed. As had been the case with Fleming and Murray, she was also given some latitude to create a classification scheme, though, after the difficulties with Murray's complex approach and the delays that it caused, I'm sure there was some encouragement to not reinvent the wheel if it could be avoided, a sentiment that was likely reinforced by the fact that Cannon had chosen to board with Williamina Fleming after taking her job at the observatory. Just as she quickly settled into the work of nightly observing the variable stars near the celestial North Pole, Cannon took to the work of spectral classification with ease. While she would work a bit more slowly at first, in time she would be able to classify two or three stars a minute from a plate photograph. As she picked up the telltale spectral signs of different types of stars, she began to mull over, in her mind, the two classification systems that had been used at Harvard. Fleming's, of course, was simpler, but it was purely empirical, based only on the features of the spectra rooted in Secchi's original scheme. 
Murray's classification, however, was based on an evolutionary model that assumed stars began hot after an initial collapse phase and then cooled slowly over time. The difficulty with the second system, however, was that it was frighteningly complex. What Cannon did, after gathering enough data from the spectra of southern hemisphere stars being photographed for the extension to the Draper catalog, was to adopt Fleming's simpler lettering system. However, she arranged them according to the evolutionary model Murray had worked with and that followed a more logical sequence based on the strength of what are known as the Balmer hydrogen lines, those absorption lines created by the presence of hydrogen in a star. As we've discussed this system in some detail in a previous episode, I won't go into much detail about it here other than to say that it seemed to make a great deal of sense even though it was clearly what philosophers of science now refer to as a quote-unquote theory-laden approach. This means that the classification scheme, as an organizing principle, reflected a preconceived hypothetical model. Whereas Fleming's system didn't assume any sort of physical processes that were taking place, Murray's and hence Cannon's did. To digress into philosophy of science for just a moment, This is one of the really interesting things about a lot of what takes place in science, in the doing of science, sometimes for the better and occasionally for the worse. In gathering data, whether for a natural history or as a more specific study of a limited system, the data usually has to be organized or related to itself in some fashion. How one chooses to do that organization can happen in two broadly different ways. One way is to just try a bunch of different permutations of the data to see if any of them produce a pattern that might indicate some sort of underlying physical relationship. This is what Mendeleev and some of his predecessors more or less did with what would become known as a periodic table. And this is known as a theory-neutral approach. The other way to do things is to organize the data with some already existing set of ideas regarding how the system or systems being studied work or are physically related. An example of this might be to do what Kepler did with orbital periods and distances. He had an idea that there was this force being created by the sun that got weaker the further away a planet was from the sun. With this idea, he assumed that there would be a relationship between how long it took for a planet to go around the sun and how far away from the sun that planet was, something that he would discover after 10 years of trying different kinds of things. This is known as a theory-laden approach to organizing the data. Now, many philosophers of science suggest that truly theory-neutral models descriptions, organizing principles, all of those kinds of things, are actually few and far between, if they even truly exist at all. The argument of these philosophers is that we all carry with us certain preconceptions about how reality works, and those can't help but be baked into any ideas that we have related to how we see reality, or the models that we use to represent it. While some scientific realists dispute the strongest version of this argument, it is hard to argue that given the history of theory-laden explanations, that this isn't the dominant way in which scientific research proceeds. What's even more interesting, however, is that even when theories or mental models are flawed, they often produce progress in the fields of study they apply to. If we take a look at Kepler's work, for example, While his idea of a force was in fact correct, uniquely so, the specifics of how that force worked to produce the motions of the planets was fundamentally flawed. Nevertheless, the idea guided his research that would eventually produce his third law of planetary motion. The same will be true for Cannon's classification scheme. While the prevailing model of stellar evolution at that time would be shown to be very wrong down the road, The idea that the progression of various features in the stellar spectra were tied to a physical process or variable that changed in a continuous way was actually fundamentally correct. Cannon's decision to organize the spectra on the strength of the Balmer lines was the right way to proceed, even if she had decided to do that for what were more or less incorrect reasons. 
This approach also allowed her to recognize that many of Fleming's distinctions were gradations of the same underlying spectral feature, and so she was able to go from 15 classes down to 10, with the last three, R, N, and P, being very much special cases, seen to be outside of that core framework of, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. As a third project, Cannon began to keep a library of index cards that documented what was known about each variable star that had been discovered and whose information had either been published at Harvard, in the announcements of other observatories, or could be gathered from data being collected by the growing number of amateur observers Pickering and his colleagues were recruiting. Cannon's ability to read both German and French allowed her to quickly comb through the publications coming from Europe to add their announcements to the library. In time, it would contain records of over 200,000 variable stars. As the data began to accumulate in both the Southern Stars Spectral Catalog and the Variable Star Library, Cannon continued to work with developing a robust observation methodology with the polar variables each night. The goal is to come up with a more reliable way to estimate magnitude by comparison with other nearby stars. The usual method of doing this was based on the correct idea that while the human eye has difficulty making comparisons between stars of very different brightnesses, it had been shown to be much better when the difference between the two stars was half a magnitude or less. Thus, the usual plan was for each variable being observed to be compared to a nearby star that was just a little brighter or just a little dimmer and then to work from that. What made this a bit more complicated though was that if a variable star brightened or dimmed a lot that comparison star might be might not actually be close enough in brightness to actually work really well. Therefore what Cannon did was create a sort of chain of stars with brightnesses that differed by half a magnitude or so that a specific variable could be compared to as it moved through its cycle of light curve. So if it's in its dim phase you look at one star, if it's a little brighter you look at a somewhat different star, if it gets to the bright part you're looking at a third brighter star, whatever the case may be. But you create sort of a chain of comparison stars each only about half a magnitude apart that you then compare that variable star to as it goes through its cycle of brightening and dimming. All of this work took a lot of time to do and for there to be enough data to really draw conclusions really took quite a while. As such, it wasn't until after the turn of the century that Cannon's work began to see the light of day through publication. In 1900, the same year she took over Harvard's card catalog library of variable stars, Cannon accompanied Pickering, Anna Draper, and Williamina Fleming to the small town of Washington, Georgia, not far from where I live, to observe the solar eclipse that took place on May 28th of that year. One of the goals of that expedition was to continue the search for a planet or series of objects between the orbit of Mercury and the Sun. Known as the Vulcan Hypothesis, finding such an object or series of objects had been a long-term goal of astronomers since the French physicist and astronomer Urbain Le Verrier had first suggested the possibility of such an object on the basis of orbital irregularities discovered in Mercury's path around the Sun. As we discussed in our episode on false gods, Vulcan would turn out not to exist, as the differences in Mercury's actual orbit from what was theoretically predicted would only be resolved by Einstein's theory of general relativity. 1901 would see the publication of Cannon's new spectral classification scheme, and it would include the ability to designate stars who showed transitional features that might place it mostly in one class but also just a little bit in another. As an example, a B to A star would have features mostly consistent with that of a B class star, but there might be in that spectra just a few more features that were just in line just a bit with what one might see in an A class star. Compared to that, a star classified as B5A would show more of the features consistent with that A classification. While Murray's spectral line characteristics and the subclassifications that went with them were now dropped, 
the observations these features showed were actually documented in the extensive notes Cannon wrote for each entry. While Hertzsprung would complain about this change, most of the astronomical community welcomed the simplification Cannon's system embraced. In 1903, Cannon would publish Harvard's first quote-unquote provisional catalog of variable stars, something she would update on a fairly regular basis, especially as the work of Henrietta Leavitt really began to bear fruit. This first catalog published the information known about 1,227 variable stars in tabular form, thus allowing easy access to the information about each. When Henrietta Swan Leavitt mastered her variable finding techniques, Cannon was then asked to learn them and assist in the broad survey of the photographic plates Harvard had gathered, where Pickering instituted the project with that goal of finding as many variable stars as possible. This work would proceed through 1906 and 1907. During that year, Cannon would move out of her room with Williamina Fleming in order to make room for other members of Fleming's extended family. She invited her recently widowed older half-sister to join her in Cambridge and the two rented a place together. The arrangement worked out very well for both women as they were often seen together at various social functions around town with Cannon using a carbon hearing aid to allow her to enjoy the various plays and musical performances the two attended. At this point, I would like to shift to a brief overview of the highlights of the remainder of Cannon's career in order to focus on the more fundamental importance of her scientific work. In 1910, she participated in a survey that would eventually lead to the adoption of her classification scheme, at least in a provisional sense, by the international astronomical community in 1922. This adoption was due in part to the truly astonishing number of stellar spectra Cannon had classified using it. By the time of her death in 1941, she had classified over 350,000 stars. In 1911, she was named Curator of Astronomical Photographs after Fleming's passing, though due to a change in leadership at the university and an accompanying shift in the philosophy of a proper place of a woman at an institution of higher education, something that just seems rather, I don't know, ignorant nowadays. This was really a title only, not a position as it had been. It would not be until another change in presidents that Cannon would hold an official position at Harvard. While the observatory's oversight committee was horrified by the slight, writing, quote, that though she has recognized the world over as the greatest living expert in this line of work, and her services to the observatory are so important, yet she holds no official position at the university." End quote. Cannon merely continued on with her work. During this time, she also began making yearly trips to the small Nantucket Observatory, where Maria Mitchell had once discovered a comet, in order to give lectures to the small astronomical and historical society that kept the memory of that pioneering female astronomer alive. In 1912, these activities led to the establishment of one of the first scholarships devoted specifically to the research efforts of young women astronomers. In that same year, the newly named American Astronomical Society named Cannon its treasurer, making her the first woman to be an officer of a scientific society in the United States. In 1913, she and her sister traveled to Europe to attend a variety of astronomical meetings and to see the sights of a civilization that, though they didn't know it, was on the verge of destroying much of its cultural heritage in an all-consuming war. In 1914, the Royal Astronomical Society recognized the work in the same way it had Williamina Fleming's, by making her an honorary member. Such honors would roll in for the rest of Cannon's life. As the American observatories worked to make up for the gap left as their European counterparts were engulfed in the senseless slaughter of the Great War, Cannon was front and center among most of the conversations related to stellar spectra. When, in 1919, Edward Pickering died, Cannon played a significant role in bringing Harlow Shapley as his replacement. In 1921, she endured the passing of her longtime colleague and friend Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and so it was likely something of a mercy when she decided to travel to Peru with Solon Bailey the following spring for a six-month stint away from the observatory in Cambridge to process all that had taken place. 
In Peru, she once again took her own photographic plates and she was able to do an initial analysis of them at the site. She also found some space to rediscover the joy of working in the field of astronomy. After returning from Peru, Cannon and her sister moved into a small bungalow on Bond Street just past the observatory grounds. They nicknamed their home the Star College and hosted many gathering of the observatory staff there. I think my favorite anecdote from this time in her life was the motto inscribed in her guest book, quote, since Eve ate apples, much depends on dinner, end quote. Over the course of the next 20 years, Cannon would work to make opportunities in astronomy possible for women of talent, going so far as to endow the Annie Jump Cannon Prize given by the American Astronomical Society to a female researcher within five years of having earned her PhD who is engaged in important work in the field of astronomy or some other field directly related to it. Cannon would pass away on April 13th of 1941 at the age of 77, three years after having been made the William C. Bond astronomer of, Harvard, of the Harvard University and a year after her retirement. Her accomplishments are too long to list here, but I think it's useful to take a moment to discuss the real source of her success. There's no question that Cannon was a talented and gifted observer and thinker, but what stands out to me, and always has, was her amazing capacity for work. The size of the catalogs she published over her lifetime are staggering in both their breadth and their depth. We've quoted just a few of the numbers of those publications, but it should be noted that she brought a similar energy to all of her other endeavors. She worked hard to create scientific networks and communicate through those so that the broadest number of researchers could have access to the data being gathered all over the world. She mentored younger women who were coming into the field and helped create opportunities for them to continue in the profession after they left the observatory. Sometimes, science proceeds on the flash of insight an individual mind might have, but much more often it is propelled by lots and lots and lots of hard work, and I don't think there's anybody I know of in all of the research that I've done on various scientists that exemplifies this better than Annie Jump Cannon. In my time as a researcher, I saw that it was the willingness to put in the time needed day in and day out, that led to the greatest insight and success. For those considering pursuing scientific research, know that you don't have to be some otherworldly sort of intellect like a Feynman or an Einstein or a Stephen Hawking or something like that to make important contributions. More often than not, and I should say much more often than not, it is the willingness to do the work that will lead to the most positive outcome. Our other subject for this episode is Cannon's fellow Radcliffe alumna, Henrietta Swan Levitt. Levitt was born on July 4th of 1868 in Lancaster, Massachusetts. Her father, George Roswell Levitt, was a congregational minister with roots all the way back to the founding of the original Massachusetts Bay Colony. At some point during her childhood, and I've had a hard time sort of tracking down the exact date on this, her father accepted a call to the pulpit at Plymouth Congregational Church in Cleveland, Ohio. In time, she would practice with the Oberlin Conservatory's choir and orchestra, acquiring a love of music that would last the rest of her life. She attended after that the co-educational Oberlin College, and upon the completion of the first two years of a college curriculum, she went to Radcliffe to study classics, at least initially. However, over time, she gravitated towards the sciences, specifically astronomy, and ended up taking Arthur Seale's class. Impressed with her work and her insight, Seale recommended Pickering bring her on as a volunteer calculator in 1895, just a year before Canon. Her initial assignment was to work to create a way to assign a photometric magnitude to a star photographed on a photographic plate 
by comparing that star with any number of variable stars in the polar region of the sky that could be found on that same plate. From her journals, we know that she thought of this process in somewhat musical terms, with a star sort of setting a certain note in her mind as she looked at its brightness. As she worked from one star to the next, the notes went up and down as the subject was brighter or dimmer than its predecessor. Variable stars, she found, could range over octaves of pitch as they cycled through their light curve. As she commenced this work, she learned that she was beginning to suffer from the gradual loss of her hearing. As this progressed, Levitt became more and more withdrawn, finding herself becoming deeply engrossed in her work to the exclusion of her interaction with others. When Annie Jump Cannon was hired a short time later, the two women bonded over their shared ailment as Cannon began to teach the younger Levitt how to get by in the world. When an opportunity to travel came about, Henrietta, perhaps inspired by the stories Cannon told of her own trips to Europe, left the university to look over the wider world. She traveled twice to Europe and in between returned home which was, by the way, now Beloit, Wisconsin, to teach as an art assistant at Beloit College. As time passed, however, she began to realize just how much she missed the collegiality of the observatory and the focused nature of her work there. And so, in 1903, she wrote Pickering to ask if there was any work for her to do. Fortunately, Andrew Carnegie had recently funded a grant that allowed for the hiring of additional calculators, and so Pickering invited her to join the staff as a paid reader, which was something he could offer her at a slightly higher rate than the typical calculator. So skilled was she at the work that when six months later Carnegie abruptly terminated his support of the Draper project, Pickering found other money to keep her on the staff. It is here that she was given the work with variable stars in the Orion Nebula as her foremost project. As we discussed in the episode on variable stars, she developed two important techniques that would help first her and then others at the observatory quickly identify variables for further, more detailed study. If identifying stellar spectra was Cannon's forte, Levitt became the master of finding variables. By 1905, many were the congratulations pouring into Pickering, commenting on Levitt's talent in finding the hard-to-recognize phenomenon. Soon, Solon Bailey in Peru is writing to urge the director to expand the search for variable stars by calling for an international effort. While Pickering did just this, he also pushed forward on his in-house efforts to nail down as many of these as possible. In this, he recruited Cannon and another calculator, Evelyn Leland, who had been working with Bailey on photometry out of the Southern Hemisphere stars, to learn Levitt's techniques and work through as much of the data Harvard had collected on plates as they could. This effort would pretty much consume all of 1906. While this broad sky survey was taking place, Levitt also continued her work on what had been interrupted by her sojourns abroad, as well as a project of finding variable stars in the large and small Magellanic clouds. This latter project would reveal hundreds of new variables that Levitt would publish in 1908. Shortly after this, she would first notice that for 16 of the variables that she was attempting to study and characterize, the brighter they were, the longer they took to cycle through their light curve. Intrigued by this correlation, Levitt had planned to follow up when she was afflicted with a serious illness during that winter. In fact, so serious was the illness that it would take her more than a year to recover fully and return to Harvard in 1910. While I've not been able to find an account of what that disease actually was, it's very possible that she was struck by a flu virus that so weakened her immune system that she then contracted severe pneumonia. Upon returning to Cambridge, she lived with her uncle Erasmus Darwin Levitt, an engineer and inventor who had a home not far from the observatory. While she worked to settle back into her routine, she was again interrupted, this time by the death of her father in early 1911. Returning home to help her mother settle the reverence estate, she was shocked and saddened to learn of Williamina Fleming's passing, an event that shook the observatory staff very deeply. As Fleming's duties were assigned to other members of the calculator team, Levitt found solace in returning to the work so long set aside. 
At first, she worked to continue to identify variables in the two clouds, large and small. And soon her tally there exceeded 1,700 variable stars. But as she was able, she continued to work to determine the periods of the individual variable star light curves that specifically matched a certain shape that she was looking for. We now call these Cepheid variables. In a short time, she added another nine stars to her study and found that they too obeyed the relationship that she had found for the first 16. Showing her work to Pickering, the two agreed that it was important and so it was published in 1912 with a note from Pickering saying that the relationship was quote unquote remarkable. This period luminosity relationship, also known as Levitt's Law, allowed Hertzsprung to make the first estimates of the distance to the small Magellanic Cloud. His number, 30,000 light years, would be a huge shock to the astronomical community and establish the importance of Levitt's work even if only to a small number of specialized researchers at the time. For her part, Levitt didn't really follow up on the idea of using a relationship to establish distances to various things in the heavens. In her mind, she was a variable hunter, a gatherer of those elusive and sometimes not so elusive creatures and the data that characterize them. In her photographic photometry project, Henrietta soon had help in the form of one Margaret Harwood, another fellow Radcliffe grad who had worked on a variety of projects at the observatory since joining the staff five years earlier in 1907. Working together, the two of them established a fundamental methodology that's still used today to classify, or I should say, to really measure the photometric brightness or magnitude of stars on pictures taken by different telescopes. While this method is not so much needed with the modern CCD cameras and the like, it's still important when going back over old data recorded on photographic plates going back over a hundred years. By 1914, Levitt's work was widely known, though the sort of formal recognition that it followed the publication of Fleming's and Cannon's contributions would el elude her. No longer feeling comfortable outside of her usual surroundings, Levitt didn't travel to the various conferences others were so often going to or coming from. Instead, she remained at the observatory, supervising the work when the other officers were away, something she was well disposed towards, giving her unflaggingly pleasant nature. In that year, the newly minted PhD Harlow Shapley visited Harvard. Shapley had stuttered under Henry, Norris, Russell, and so was very familiar with the variable star work being done by Cannon and Levitt. During his visit, he received a piece of advice from Solon Bailey, who was back at Cambridge for a time. The older man told Shapley, soon to depart for the newly opened Mount Wilson Observatory in California, that no one was really spending a lot of time thinking about a particular type of cluster known as a globular cluster. He would be wise, Bailey suggested, to look into it. Shapley, within a few months of arriving at Mount Wilson, took the Harvard man up on his advice and soon began finding the type of variable stars Levitt's Law seemed to apply to, stars, as we said, that are known as Cepheid variables. As we will see in a future episode, this would lead to a rather significant discovery. Over the course of the next few years, Levitt's attention would remain focused on her work of variable hunting, and so Shapley would have to sort of trudge on alone in his looking at the question of Cepheid variables and globular clusters. However, with his appointment as the new director of the Harvard Observatory in 1921, he hoped to once again bring Levitt back to what he rightly viewed as the most important discovery of the last 20 years of astronomical research. Almost immediately, Shapley engaged Levitt in a project to show that there was a second type of variable, what's now known sometimes as an RR Lyra variable, and that's more common than Cepheid variables, that followed a similar period luminosity relationship. However, just as this project began to bear fruit, the observatory learned the terrible news that Miss Levitt had cancer of the stomach. Both Shapley and Annie Jump Cannon, along with other members of the observatory staff, paid visits to Levitt's hospital room. These visits meant a great deal to Henrietta, as they not only eased her loneliness and anxiety in her final days, but they also confirmed the idea that she and her work at the observatory 
had really been fundamentally important. On December 12th, at 10.30 p.m., she breathed her last. Two days later, Annie Jump Cannon wrote in her journal, quote, Henrietta's funeral at Chapel of First Congregational Church, 2 p.m. Coffin covered with flowers, end quote. Her brevity betraying the depth of loss that she felt with the passing of her friend. This brings our episode this week to a close. We've got one more show in this series of supplementals to do, but before we do that, I'm presenting a paper at the summer meeting of the American Association of Physics Teachers next weekend. The topic is on the history of the metric system and how it grew out, grew out of the events of revolutionary France. As I only have eight minutes to present my ideas, like I'm really going to present a whole lot of ideas in eight minutes. I've decided I'm going to produce a longer podcast episode that goes into greater detail so those people who are at my talk will have a way to get more information. And since I'm going to do that, I might as well share it here with you all. So look for that episode this next weekend. This week's shout out goes to the listeners in the Sooner State, specifically those in Oklahoma City. Thanks for being a part of the crew and give us a shout back on the podcast Facebook page if you have a minute. For those who are looking for other ways to follow us, you can find us at thescientificodyssey.typepad.com or you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Chad Davies. I hope everyone in the continental U.S. is getting geared up for the upcoming full solar eclipse that will be the first to cross the entire continent in something like 100 years. It's happening on August 21st, and if you're anywhere near the path of totality, I would encourage you to find a way to get to a place where you can experience that. I guarantee it's nothing like anything you've ever seen or anything you will ever see. While I didn't cover any of this in our episodes on ancient astronomy, it should be noted that many civilizations sacrificed human beings in the hopes that such an offering would make sure that the sun returned. So terrifying was the event of a sol full solar eclipse. It's definitely not something to be missed, though I think I would forego the whole cutting your neighbor's heart out part of the program. Kind of a faux pas these days, I think. So, hopefully metric system next week, and then our final episode in our series on the Harvard Calculators with a tale of astronomical love and discovery. Until then, full sails on your journey.